Bear me a second while I just adjust the scratching mechanism on the door. Come on in. You're coming in, come in. And lie down. I assume that's the cat. I know you want to be on the podcast, but you're not really, you're not part of it. Of course he's part of it. He's the favourite third member of the podcast. He is the butt crumble provider. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. Thank you for joining us for another episode. My name's Joe Skiffins. And I am Malcolm Childs and we are Just Making Conversation. Where we discuss the ins and outs of the model making hobby that brings us so much joy and pain in equal measures. From the greasy sprues to the gloss coats and everything in between, we are going to be Just Making Conversation. Remember, there are other podcasts that you could listen to. Plastic Model Mojo. The Scale Model Podcast. Plastic Posse Podcast. On the Bench. Model Geeks. The Sprue Cutters Union. Small Subjects. And Built Sideways. Head to modelpodcasts.com for all the links. If you've enjoyed our podcast, consider leaving a review of four or five stars. As it... Pro- Excuse me. Where did you produce that cat from? <laughs> it just popped it out of my ass. <laughs> she's got to have her nails clipped and she's really painful at the moment. Anyway. If you enjoyed our podcast, consider leaving a review or five stars as it helps promote this podcast to more people to enjoy. Showing your support to us is as easy as making a coffee. In fact, why not? Go over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash JMC podcast and do just that. Your support will help go towards making the podcast and its content just that little bit better. <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a cat sitter. That'd be nice. In this here episode, we will be just making conversation about a scratch building. The wonders of those extra bits you can add to your model or diorama, or even making that entire model from nothing that just isn't available in kit form. Sometimes your funds can't stretch to buy all the add-ons in resin and photo etch, or just for the hell of it, you like to find a cheap alternative. What stops you from seeing scratch building as more fun than building a kit with instructions? Why do you rely on being able to purchase those kit extras? Or are you that person that says, I can't do scratch building? Did it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense enough (laughs) for us. So scratch building is the subject at hand. So scratch building is on the neon sign above my head that reminds me that we are talking about scratch building today. Mm Mm-hmm. What's scratch building, James? Well, scratch building is um, basically anything in which you build or detail or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Um, Added detail to a kit, that's scratch building. So if it doesn't come with instructions and you have to figure a way in which you manipulate it to produce what you want, for example, putting wiring in an airplane, building an engine from a a famous yogurt company, or building a whole spacecraft out of containers that you find in your recycling bin. You know, that's all scratch building. Building from scratch. Yeah, basically. So from nothing, from rubbish, from bits, from bits and bobs. You can build from the ashes something awesome we've done a build haven't we where we we did a scratch build um most people went into their box of bits that they got left over and stuck stuff together to make something it was called um it was called bits box build yeah big box build yeah which is pretty cool to do if you've not tried it before you should try it definitely a lot of people had made sci-fi things hadn't they yeah they had gone full on sci-fi i seem to remember yeah and um, put the little stuff together to make it look cool and then paint it mm-hmm yeah, that was good fun. I don't think where mine is, actually. Uh, looking at it in, in my bookcase of plastic bits, it's not in there. I don't know. Oh. It. Maybe maybe it's in one of the boxes in the garage. Maybe. But I have brought with me brought with me a scratch build project that I did do Ooh. just for this very, very chat. And I imagine you have too. 
Have you? Yes, I, I've got something on the bench as it, as it stands at the moment. So my cameras are not working, so I can't go top down. <laughs> well, that's that's probably good, and and because it's Radio Two, then uh, it won't work. And when I say that, I don't it's mean not radio. radio Two. I mean podcast. Sorry. Radio 2 is a completely different channel. Yeah, but we get some pretty good funding for it if we were. I don't know how many seasons we class. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so it's this one. This is a saloon from... That's right, yes. The Wild West, I guess. Uh, but it's what it was looking like like five years ago. So it's quite dilapidated and destroyed and everything else. Um, it's now burnt down. So if it was uh, accurate to how it is now, it would just be a pile of bits. Pile of ash. Yeah, I actually burnt down about a couple of months after I finished making that model, which is odd. Mm. I don't know if the two are connected. Well, so far the detectives haven't come round to ask <laughs> about my arson. You know, I didn't want to destroy the evidence because I got it, got it slightly historically incorrect. So I thought if I changed the reference pictures, then... Yeah, good idea. I built that from scratch from absolutely nothing, um, from bits of plastic card. Mm. And it was one of the most fun models I've ever built. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. On the top of the list, because it was just completely, complete freedom. It was like the equivalent of doing yoga on top of a mountain naked. It was completely open and free, and I had nothing to stop me doing anything I wanted to do. And uh, it really worked. I really enjoyed making it. I'm very, very proud of it. When you post pictures of it so everyone can see when we, when we put the podcast out, that they don't look at that saloon and picture you naked on top of a mountain doing yoga. Because that would be quite disturbing. No, well, I, I I felt free when I was doing it. I'm just trying yes. to describe the the feeling, yeah, the deep and emotional connection that I had when I, I made it. See, the, the the one thing in which I like about scratch building is leaving my current project to one side for a second. Is that you 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 did have freedom? Yes, absolutely, um, and I can totally relate to how that feels. But a lot of the scratch building I've done are to do with dioramas and stuff. Uh-huh. And most of that, 99% of it, is purely from my head. So there's no reference picture or anything. Right. And that is totally liberating because you can do what you want. You can literally add a bathroom or throw or six or, mm-hmm. or one. The reason I mention that is because I think a lot of people that do models that come out of a kit and then do a base don't necessarily relate that to scratch building because, you know, people will put – will make a road, they'll make a wall, or they'll make some trees, some flowers, or foliage of some description. Mm-hmm. And it's all it's all scratch building. It's it's from nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But materials. A blob of something turning it into a thing. Mm. Rather than following instructions on the kit. Yeah, you're right. What about you then? You said that you weren't going to talk about the kit right now. What's the kit in front of you that you want to talk about? Well, what I'm actually building at the moment, it just happens that I'm doing a lot of additional stuff to a kit that I have, which is the um, Infinities Model 132nd Helldiver. And for some crazy reason, I've decided to open up panels that didn't need opening up and add the interior of what would be there. So I have amassed 30, 40 pictures of different parts or different views of the aircraft in different states of nakedness. Uh Uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> there you go see yeah, yeah. Uh, to try and recreate what you might be able to see it's not going to be 100 percent accurate because if i'm honest i might just throw myself off a bridge if i went too bad on it it's it's pretty damn accurate though you've got to say it's pretty damn on the money in terms of what it looks like it will give it certainly will give a good illusion maybe people that listen aren't aware of what i'm doing so uh, what i've done is i've opened up a couple of access panels in the um, area just behind the bulkhead. So in that area, there will be wiring. There is a a tank, of which I'm not quite sure what it actually holds um, because I haven't researched that bit. But it's a tank, which very kindly has been made for me in a CAD, which I've then 3D printed, which is super fun, I've got to be honest. Is that a scratch building? Um, I'd... (laughs) <laughs> I didn't have to do the CAD, which makes it so much fun. Um, but, yeah, thanks, thanks, Dan, for doing that. The other thing I've done is I've opened up a little panel, which is the other side of the firewall, which is just behind the in- instrument panel. And I've put all the wires in, and the idea being that I'll be able to form some sort of light in there with a mechanic looking to be fixing it. 
if you like. Oh, right. Yeah. So you'll be able to see an illusion of what's in there. So with that, I have literally scratch built everything that's in that little section. So uh, some ducting, uh, some some pipe work, sorry, that's that's in there. Yeah. There is some wiring. And all these pictures will be up on the page, yeah? Yeah, they'll, they'll all be there. And the, the junction box that's there, oh, it's not really, a, it's really hard to describe, but it's like a junction box with yeah. pipes coming in and out of it. I've tried to recreate that, and that's all myself out of plastic, bits of tube and very thin bits of this, that, and the other. So it's not 100% accurate, but it's enough to give the illusion. I think that's enough, isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that enough? And you're, you're well, talking about the illusion of detail, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, the, the hole itself is probably no more than a, a centimetre square that you can look through. Right. So you're not going to get to see an awful lot of it, but I know it's there and I've done it. Yeah. I mean, even inside the the Hellcat itself, I've done as much wiring as I dare do on the side um, between all the the components. But you you probably won't see most of that at all once it's all put together, which is a shame. But I, I've done it, so that's fine. It's obvious that you're enjoying putting all those little bits together because otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. So you're obviously enjoying it. Basically, what it comes down to is Joe McCaslin, um, a friend, good friend of mine, does super detailing on his aircraft to the point where he'll take the skin away and, and make all the framework up and all that sort of stuff. And wow. I've always been in awe of people that do that sort of thing. And I chose this kit specifically to do what I'm doing to it. And I just wanted to go just that little bit further yeah. with adding a few bits and pieces. Right. Once that compartment is finished where the tank is, there's also the rear of the engine, which again has been CAD made for me and 3D printed. Yeah. And then the engine itself will be open. So the, the kit has a representation of the engine. It has its faults here and there, but hopefully we can smooth over those and, and get it to look reasonable. Yeah. And then most of the engine will be on display as well. Nice. But just to make it a little bit more crazy, I happen to come across in my re research for this particular build. The engine is the same engine that's in the whole cat, mm -hmm. which Airfix, Thank you, Airfix. Done a wonderful job with their 124th instructions oh. to the point where they give you a wiring diagram for <laughs> the, uh, the engine. Oh, okay. What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and recreate that mm -hmm. in a different scale yeah. and add the wiring to the engine as well. That's interesting. Using the instructions as research material. That's interesting. Yeah, the, the, the rear of the engine... Uh, that was CAD drawn is a, a copy of those exactly those those instructions. They were used as a basis to make the CAD drawing. Why are you scratch building it, James? Why are you not just going out and getting the all the aftermarket bits to fill this engine with all the cool resin stuff? Because there are some aftermarket bits and pieces for this particular kit, of which I have bought one, mm -hmm. uh, which is the folding wings resin section. Okay, yeah, but the rest of it. I haven't looked that hard, if I'm honest, but I, I don't believe there is the the detail out there to buy. And that's it, isn't it? So, for example, I've I've used um, metal rod for the the I think they must call them crash bars or something like that in the in the mounting of that section. With this particular kit, I think there's about four or five different extras you could buy. Right, and they're not they're not super expensive. Don't get me wrong, but once you add them all up, they are. Yeah, well, this is the thing, isn't it? The reason people scratch build is because the, the stuff doesn't exist that they want to put in their kit or the money. Yeah, well, this is it. And plus also, it's been really it's been really entertaining trying to figure out what to use to be able to achieve the, the look. So you're trying to find the right types of wire, trying to find the right types of rod. Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, when I did the, the wire into the instrument panel, I wired it all up and went, oh, look at that, aren't I clever? And then went, no, the wire's too thick, and pulled it all off and let's start again. Yeah. I mean, I've recorded it. It's on, on my YouTube channel, what I've done, and I've shown the mistakes in which I've made. So, for example, the wiring, I've shown how I've done that, and then the next episode, I've gone, oh, yeah, I didn't like that, so I ripped it all off. This is what it looks like now. Cool. It's just really fun. And like I say, the challenge was really to allow myself a little bit of freedom to do something just a little bit different to a kit. Yeah. And I went large purposely because I thought it'd give me a little bit more room of leeway to use the skills in which I've got. Are you? And I guess you can decide whether you're going to keep those panels open or not. If you think maybe the scratch building wasn't up to scratch, 
you could say, screw it, I'll close the panel. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave them open. At the end of the day, for me, it's an experiment. Mm. So I'm suitably happy with what I've achieved so far. Good. I sent Carl a picture and said, oh, look at this. What do you think of that? One of my go-to gurus in which I quite often will bend their ear and go, look, look at this. I used to do that for me, and then I, I, I told you what I think, and then you don't do it anymore. Yeah, you, you give me the wrong responses. Yeah. yeah, I sent him a picture, and, and he said, uh, and his, his words were, I know it's given you a lot of stress and grief, but my God, it's well worth it. Well done. Ah, okay. yeah, cool. The instrument panel is a flatbed plastic, of which then the dial section is clear plastic. Mm-hmm. Which, in a way, makes complete sense. Yep. Fine, you stick them onto the panel, that's great. However, the way they've done the re- the release point for that uh, mould is right on the back of the instrument panel, right on top of two dials, and it's like um, two mil. So you have to cut it off yeah, to be able to put it flat onto the instrument panel, which I just didn't understand at all. It made no sense to me. It didn't make any sense to me either. However... Yeah, I gotta be honest with you. Once you chip it off and sand it back and polish it up, you wouldn't know. You just wouldn't know. So I am absolutely gobsmacked because that's the same on every single clear plastic panel, and there's eight of them in all. Yeah, and and I honestly thought they're going to be horrendous. The only one thing I would say is if you come across a kit like that, just be really careful just how much plastic you use the clippers on. Mm. To take off because what you can do is crack the remaining plastic yeah um across the dial and that's a bit depressing but yeah i've really enjoyed doing it you really really have yeah it's been a great distraction what other scratch building have you been doing as well then in the past mainly it's my dioramas yeah. So probably one of my biggest scratch builders was the sacrifice on the altar of freedom, which was the interior of a church. Yeah. All of that was scratch built. Everything was made from materials that were nothing what they ended up like. Yeah. 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 Oh, apart from the stained glass windows. And the dude. Yeah. And the dude, obviously, I've, I, I've always wanted to manipulate figures, but never been, I really had the courage to. Right. And I had to manipulate that a little bit. Not a great deal, but that was a, a, a bit of a learning curve. There's two figures in that build, and there's apart from one figure, everything is manipulated or scratched or mucked around with in some form. Uh, yeah, adjusted to your requirements. Yeah. As I said before, you've got complete freedom to put whatever you want in. And if you've got a good vision of what you want, you, you're winning. One thing I would say about scratch building from right from the off is if anyone wants to give it a go, make a plan. Yeah. Even if it's your diorama and you you want to scratch build everything on it, do a drawing right out or, or write out what you want to achieve because the, the, the worst thing possible is for you to start down the road and suddenly realise it's not achieving what you want and you've got to take it all apart and either redo it or rejig it. So, so make a plan. That's something that I didn't I didn't do with my saloon Wild West uh, build thing I got here. I didn't plan the sort of size of it. I kind of had the base and I knew what sort of size I wanted it to be, but it ended up being like all the dimensions were slightly off. It didn't, didn't matter because it's not a, a historical representation. It uh, as I started to put the roof on and things like that, I had to change the amount of panels and things that were on there. But mm. having having a a plan that's reasonably detailed is important. Um, not so that you have the right amount of materials and things, but just so that whatever you're coming out is going to fit in the thing that you're doing. Yeah, like what I've been doing with the, the hell diver. I don't like research. I really don't. I really don't like putting a picture up of this is the research I found Yeah, uh, and this is what I've done. Because in my mind, I'm making a representation that I think fits, not an accurate 100% recreation of the picture I'm using. Hmm. Unfortunately... One of the things I've noticed with the particular build, this particular build, is I've done numerous amounts of research. I've bought a book on it, which not like me. I've got 20-odd photos that I've found, luckily, of a hell diver being restored. So it's yeah. quite good in that respect. But then I've also found 
have stolen, if you like, some of the bits and pieces out of instructions from other kits. Yeah, you said that, yeah. You know, I've done an awful lot more than I normally would for any build, but it's important to do that. And any scratch build, and I think you need to have some form of reference because I've certainly learned in the past, and I've said about this before in other podcasts, I built a diorama where I had the, the walls, that's all I had from a vacuum form thing that you pour plaster into and then i started building everything and if i planned it i'd still have it and it would be finished it wasn't what i wanted did it take the different amount of time than you imagined it would or it was the wrong sort of size no what i meant was the detail that i wanted to achieve because what it was through the process of doing that particular diorama i was finding lots of information about how to do certain detail and certain bits and pieces right and they weren't in the plan okay they were things that I found along the way. They went, oh, oh, I could do that. Got to try that. Right. If you have a vision, have a little bit of a plan, you can figure out whether you're going to add hinges to a door or window <laughs> and how you might possibly do that before you start. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'm with you. Just an example. Not that anyone would do that, of course, James. Yeah. But also, <laughs> saying that, it's kind of fun just to wing it as well, I mean, just to see what happens. I guess you need kind of a framework and then have fun filling those gaps. My advice, if you're going to do a scratch build of anything, make a very rough, uh, you know, two minute on the back of a fag packet yeah. drawing of what it is you want, a representation of what you want. Take a couple of minutes to look at that drawing and think to yourself, okay, do I want to just build it or do I want to achieve uh, a learning curve and what is that learning curve what is it i want to learn through the process yeah and first off drawing of a house i'm going to build that bosh Bosh. the next time you do it maybe you can say right okay now i want to add in some finer detail don't start something and then go oh, actually no i want to add that oh i want to add that oh i want to add that because you'll a you'll never finish it and b the work that you did at the beginning won't match what you're doing at the end and that may give you a negative response which i can only go by what's happened to me in the past so yeah yeah i remember watching a video by scale model medic which we've mentioned before in the first season Mm. john i don't know if you know the guy yeah i do yeah he did a video about scratch building and he was always talking about the illusion of detail yeah or something Something similar. The idea was that he was putting detail into uh, a Jeep or a Cooper wagon or something, where he was putting something down in the glove box area. Mm -hmm. All it was he was doing is putting like a box inside the wheel well to give the impression that there was something in there, that it wasn't just a big open space. It didn't have to be anything in particular. It was just an extra kind of few angles, essentially. But just doing that, just adding that little bit extra to the kit, made a bit of a difference to what the interior looked like. You know, it has something else to for your eye to fall on. And it was amazing, actually, what, what difference that just little extra little box in there made to just to look in inside. And that was my first introduction to sort of scratch building and, and why you would want to do it. I remember uh, making, like, up a avionics box for inside an F-14. And I... I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kind of got a bit of plastic and stuck little lines on it and made little dials and buttons and stuff like that. Mm. And it looked, you know, effective. It wasn't obviously anything to do with the accuracy whatsoever, but it, it looked like there was something in it, mm. which gave a great impression for the whole entire kit when you look at the whole thing. Speaking to Joe about the work he does, I, I've messaged him a few times and said, oh, I'm struggling with this. I'm not quite sure how to get this accurate or blah, blah, blah you can really easily get hung up on it. And he said, Mm. don't worry about the accuracy. You're creating an illusion. Mm. That really is all it's about. Just making something be a little bit different to everybody else. Yeah. And actually increasing the level of fun you had by adding just a little bit of something. Yeah, yeah. And as we spoke about this before, about the Easter eggs and, you know, the posters inside armoured vehicles. And obviously we've got the Walnut Challenge group build going on at the moment some fantastic entries incidentally we'll come to that later but one of the entries done by ian ian dathway uh, yeah really really clever idea within that he scratch built a little box that goes inside the nut and all that really is is finding a picture printing the picture out and folding over some edges to make it look like a box he's not physically made the box he's just made the illusion of the box mm. And that's fantastic. 
you know the same as the the picture we've used for the promotion of this episode mm -hmm. uh, is one i found on the internet the person has used a a yogurt a small yogurt drink uh, and has, has used that as the basis because it's got the right shapes for making an engine and the amount of people i talk to that are model makers who say they go around hobby shops in the uk we've got a, co a company called hobbycraft who do all hobbies so you know there's knitting there's painting there's floristry models burning of wood and whatever they call that pyrography there's a whole myriad of hobbies in there and the amount of people i talk to who, who say oh, i've gone into hobbycraft today it's like yeah did you look at the kits no no i was i was looking at all the other stuff mm -hmm. beads uh, beads yeah and you can get little sequins stick on sequins which are the right size and shape for a rivet because it's a different alternative and, and to have that ability to 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 see things and go oh i know i can do that that's amazing it's really really cool yeah a couple of people i know will, will walk on walks and things and they'll be looking down at the floor and they'll pick up a bit of lichen or a twig or a root or something oh that'd be a perfect tree the objects you need to make a convincing diorama is around you all day long. Yeah. You don't have to go anywhere. It's, it's there right in front of you. It's the typical uh, male thing as well, isn't it? A little boy's picking up rocks and bits of twigs and sticking them in their pockets, <laughs> bringing them home. Absolutely. <laughs> Talking of rocks, I watched a cracking video uh, this week. CW Modeling, uh -huh. I think it was called. He is currently building a bridge diorama. Right. He's recreating a picture that he's found of a tank underneath a railway bridge. Right. But he's scratch building the railway bridge. Of course. <laughs> and it's awesome. Yeah. It's absolutely, oh, my God, yeah. It's just inspiring, awe-inspiring. If you've not seen any of his videos on YouTube, please, please, please go and have a look. He's, he's called the, the build Bridge Not So Far. <laughs> Very clever. Very good. So basically what he's done, he's, he's, he's found a, um, a railway bridge. It's a very basic railway bridge, and he's managed to print some of the formers for the bridge, the, the main ones on the side in which you can see. Oh, the girders. Yeah, the girders, yeah. The track that he's using is out of a, a box of track made by Mini Art. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the underneath of the bridge is all scratch built. I see that, yeah. He's put in the extra girders for the, the floor to carry the track he's put rivets he's made made rivets uh with a punch yeah it's just awe inspiring just really 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 clever i'm looking at it, he's putting the bricks in here yeah this is why it was linked was because you were talking about as you walk along you pick up all sorts of bits and pieces now one of the things i saw that was really interesting in the way he did his bricks he was carving out the bricks on some xps foam mm -hmm. but then what he did was he got a stone and he rolled that stone across the top of the bricks. Okay. Because it was quite a knobbly sort of stone, it gave him the ability to push some of the, the, the bricks in. Oh, yes, I'm with you, yeah. And I thought, now that's clever. And then right at the end, rolled up a bit of uh, silver foil, rolled all over the top to create a bit of wear on the bricks as well so it didn't look quite new. Huh. Very clever. Yeah, texture, the ball of kitchen foil. Yeah. Yeah, so he's built up all the bricks and then he's going over it and squishing it all up. And it makes such a difference. Oh, amazing difference. It, 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 every time he rolls that ball over, it looks, adds an extra 20 years to those bricks. <laughs> yeah, it's quite phenomenal. I think that, that sort of encapsulates the reason why I do dioramas so much and why I, when I'm making a model that's a kit, I miss everything to do with dioramas because I'm following instructions. There's, there's no freedom. Hmm. And that freedom that you enjoyed with your ranch house. Yeah. That's what I like about model making. The downside of scratch building, I would find, is the difficulty of finding the right thing to bond the things together uh -huh. so plastic card is you know obviously fine using acetone but if i'm using like brass or something i find it really difficult to put the the brass onto the, the plastic card or whatever or i have to pin it and there's loads of things that you you need to kind of learn to how to do scratch building it's not it's going to fall apart do you know what i mean yeah yeah no absolutely so the rigidity of things is quite tricky and that's the only thing that kind of holds me back from doing scratch building all the time because I don't have that kind of skill. Do you, has that ever stopped you from putting things together because you're worried they're going to fall over? There's a lot of things in which I've done where I'm not quite sure how it's all going to hold together. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I have had the occasion that when I'm building stuff, I've I've used dress pins and all sorts to, to hold it in place, closed it up and hope to God they stay in place. But that's part of the learning curve, I think. I mean, uh, using plastic with metal rod and copper, thin brass sheets, and they're all doable, but it's, it's a case of trial and error. That's the maybe the thing that puts people off doing scratch building, is because if you could buy the thing off the shelf that is is rigid and looks accurate, there has to be a sort of a case for doing that over scratch building. Yeah. You know, obviously money <laughs> and time. You know, if you've got all the money in the world... When I built the Altar of Freedom, I searched hell and high water to try and find some small, low-level railings. Uh-huh. I went all over the place. Couldn't find anything that would suit. Even got to the point where I did actually buy some photo etch, which was for a completely different scale. Right. And I just hoped it would work. Right. And then by accident, I was talking to someone about this search. A uh, gentleman's name is Peter Bowyer. Yeah. He had come across a similar problem. But he had scratch built some railings himself. Right. It was the the sort of railings that are at the altar and you lean on when you're praying and um, having your blessings and all that sort of thing. And all that really consists of is a strip down the bottom, strip at the top, and in between some uprights and maybe some decoration of some description on the uprights. Mm -hmm. And then the twirly little bits that I did was very thin pieces of circular tube cut and then cut in half so they become a crescent ah right that was it that was it it really was as simple as that so you're breaking it down to basic shapes that's what i mean and then all we got to do is look at individual bits and think how am i going to achieve to make that come out to that next level but that's all it needs it just needs that you need to look at things and go now how can i how could i achieve that if i slice that up in some way so you got texture and you got depth and simple shapes put together to make something looks very clever. You could build anything from anything if if you had the the time and the way with all. I think what the thing about scratch building is accuracy that is something I thought was quite important. So it's, if you're making a building, accurate, clean, straight cuts. Obviously, you're trying to make a building and everything's all wobbly. It's not going to work, is it? I learned quite quickly that you need to have, you know, a good sharp blade, a nice strong steel ruler, and maybe get yourself some engineering blocks, like one, two, three blocks, that can give you that right angles as well, which is really cool. It makes gluing walls together very easily, for instance. Oh, yeah. Oh, if you're making a little box or something, it's it's really easy to use. That accuracy is, is important, I think. But... If you're making something that's all kind of knocked down and destroyed and, and everything like that, you might think you don't need accuracy, but to, to just to build the basic shape, the basic structure underneath, it needs to be reasonably strong and reasonably straight <laughs> so that you can destroy the stuff that is around it and it can stay on there and be rigid and won't fall off. It is important to have, have the right tools. And, and realistically, the only tools you need for scratch building is some carving tools of some description maybe yeah and a pair of nippers that, that really is the basics you don't need much more than that and uh, and one of the other things as well is don't don't get hung up on going to uh, uh, your model store and buying every single piece of uh, plastic there is the i beams the l shaped beams the this that, and that. you can make yep. them from just sheet um plastic yep. that's it it's um, just easier, isn't it, if you have them already made? Yeah, it is, absolutely. And also the other thing to remember as well is don't think for a second that you need to have like the really thin metal sheets or anything like that. You've got thin metal sheets in your kitchen right now mm. in the form of a silver foil or aluminum, aluminum, wherever you are in the world. Um, that's really, really useful. Um, you know, I was talking to someone only today about flags. Someone was uh-huh. saying, I, I, "I was gonna. They're gonna make a flag, and um, they're gonna cut some plastic, plastic card up, and and then heat it up, and this that." I said, well, no, "Don't do that. All you need is a, a the the silver foil of a chocolate wrapper. Yeah, put whatever decal you want on there. Prime it first. Put put the decal on top. Cut around it, and then squish it up as much as you want. You know, to to form it fluttering in the wind or whatever. And it and it's so much more effective, so much easier as well. To be honest, yeah." 
and that's the that's the thing that's the good thing i like about scratch building is you're thinking outside the box you're thinking how you can achieve certain things without necessarily going and buying it off the shelf yeah you don't even need to go and buy rolls and rolls of wire or anything like that if you've got a little bit of electric cord around <laughs> that you're that's not attached to the electric or a plug <laughs> or an appliance you need <laughs> you can you can cut that up and it gives you all the wire you need in there in the hell diver for the the inside of that firewall there's a little bit of ducting on there it looks to me as if it's like a plastic corrugated tube uh-huh like a tumble dryer tube or something or yeah yeah a little bit like that you know i i tried um molding it with with clay i tried <laughs> heating straws up all oh, right paper straws that is i got plastic tubing melted that blah 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 done all sorts of things and do you know what i used in the end i used got a bit of wire took all the wire outside and what was left was the sleeve and that's what i used <laughs> simple as that yeah it's as simple as that and it, it took me four days to figure that out yeah and it was staring me in the face all along the fun discoveries that you can make mm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that all all done and because i know i've been watching it since you started that that kit so it's going to be fun to watch indeed the efforts that you put in there'll be quite a bit of it in which i'll put effort into that you might not see but um i know i've done it so the main focus really will be the front part where the engine is and the the open bits the rest of it i won't be playing with that too much (laughs) i have sort of in a way got to the point where i I want to put it together now (laughs) you've got to kind of fight that almost haven't you yeah are you doing it so that it's only one side, or are you doing it all the way around? No, the right-hand side where it's got two panels that are open, I'm not going to do that on both sides. Right, right, right. Okay. And mainly because I've added a, a, an awful lot more detail on that bulkhead than I really need to, but I did it because I wanted to, not for any other reason. And you probably are not going to see it, if I'm honest. What I'm hoping to try and to achieve is a mechanic on a ladder or something like that that's got an electric cable with a the bulb on the end that will be hooked onto the fuselage so it will light up the area on purpose. Yeah, I like that idea. Is he going to be holding it or is it just going to be hanging there? He's either going to be holding it and sort of talking to the pilots so you can actually see in the hull. Otherwise, if he stands there looking in, he can't see nothing. Yeah. The wire itself, I've already decided. (laughs) What I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to use a little bit of fibre optic and the light will travel up the fibre optic to the model okay wow so the the fiber optic will be painted on the outside to keep the light inside the fiber optic until it gets to the end will there be enough light coming through though don't know that's that's why i'm saying i'm not quite sure if it will work that way or not yeah remember you talked about your explosion diorama you did yeah you're saying that the light wasn't strong enough once you got out and about what i may do is i'm because i have thought about this no. No, I have. I really have. <laughs> what I might do is I put some electricery inside the aircraft itself so the fibre optic is only a, the illusion of the light, but the light will be made by the bulb inside the aircraft. Yeah, so the actual ambient light is made by a big light, big bulb, but the, the light that actually hits your eyeball to show that there's a bulb there, yeah, is it, that's clever. I like that idea. Hmm. It's quite a theatrical way of, of lighting something to do that. You know, they do that in films and things, don't they? Lord of the Rings, when he has his wand and he says, light the way or something, his, his wand lights up, but it doesn't light up, you know, 300 feet of space. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but then, obviously, with the engine being uncovered, that, that'll be the main steel, if you like. Yeah, a long way to go with it, though. Keep going. Do you remember when Ian Douthwaite made um, a trailer for his truck? Yep. Have you gone down to Pets at Home, the pet shop, and bought a load of like sticks for a chinchilla or something? Yeah. You know, chinchilla sticks. Not sticks made out of chinchillas, no. but sticks for chinchillas. <laughs> and they were exactly the right size for logs in the scale that he was using. Oh, that was fascinating. He just happened to be walking around and go, oh, these are the logs. These are what we need. <laughs> this is the funny part, right? You're talking about Ian. He's an amazing modeler because he'll get a truck kit and then he'll modify it to the vehicle that he's building. Because yeah. nine times out of ten, the, the kit isn't anything like what he needs. So he's using 
okay. parts of the build. So it's converting stuff. Yeah, converting. Classic one, just recently, Luke did um, a big boy build, didn't he? The 182nd big boy loco. He did, yeah. Mm-hmm. That he did with Mike Mountain. Are you writing these down? Yes. He got involved in the build. So he did a, a 182nd big boy locomotive. But because he's into his trucks, he decided that he was scratch build, the loco being moved by truck. Oh, did he? I, I didn't even see that finished. That's quite clever. He hasn't finished it yet, but he has scratch build the trailer unit, and that's got something like 30 pairs of wheels or something. Phenomenal. But again, it's 182nd wheels. You don't, you don't really find those hanging around. So he's found something that is the right size and he's modified them from something else. The point I was making is that with him, his trucks that he's made, 80 odd percent of the truck is not the original kit. <laughs> even even the, the tractor unit, not just the trailer, the tractor unit. It's amazing. And the eye for detail is inspiring. It's not something I want to do because. He's looking at a picture. He's looking at a particular truck and going, right, okay, the mirrors aren't right. It's a right-hand drive, not a left-hand drive, (laughs) so that's wrong. The mirrors, therefore, are wrong because they're on the wrong side. The bumper was wrong. The hubcaps were wrong. You know, nearly everything on the truck was completely wrong. Gosh. So he's had to scratch build that, and that's phenomenal. Yeah, very cool. Well, we'll put all those links and photographs on the Facebook page for you to have a look at. What have you been up to lately, recently? Been to any model shows or anything like that? Um, no. Not been up to an awful lot. Oh. <laughs> I, I have, I have. Oh, it's Salisbury Model Show. Oh, yeah, how did that go? Really good. I love that show. It was the, the first show I went to that was just me going to a model show like eight years ago. Um, so it's got a lot of good memories for me. Uh, I went and uh, I spoke to um, a couple of people that listened to Just Making Conversation. Oh, wow. Um, which is great. And I gave a few stickers out. Mm-hmm. One of the people who was a bit of a fan of ours, which I was really excited about, uh, Robert Lang from Elan 13. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. I don't know why someone so as intelligent is listening to us, but perhaps a bit of escapism for him. Mm hmm. You know, that's <laughs> a slum it. <laughs> but yeah, that was really good. He had some nice things to say. I was really kind of taken aback that somebody that I I quite admire as an artist listens to our rumblings. So, hello, Robert. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Uh, what else are we going to talk about? Oh, Walnut Challenge. Yes. Because that's bloody awesome. Walnut Challenge. <laughs> Cue your nuts. I I noticed yesterday that the Walnut Challenge Group Build Facebook page is literally a few clicks away from a hundred <laughs> members. What? what are you doing, people? What's a hundred members? So welcome everybody that's that's already joined. If you haven't and you don't know anything about it, where have you been? Yeah. Come on. Well, the Walnut Challenge Group Build Facebook page. Come over, <laughs> come on, join in uh, the build itself. It's really simple. Malcolm's written some really, really good rules, yes. uh, of which I would just ask you to make sure you read the first line. Uh, that way you won't Move make on. any errors that anyone else may have. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> grab your nuts, crack them open, and uh, fill them up with all sorts of goodies. It is is basically what it's all about. Obviously, the Great British humour is strewn, I think would be the right phrase, strewn throughout the page, because anyone that says nuts immediately gets responded to by lots of <laughs> um, adults that think they're five. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, self included. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's certainly an international challenge, isn't yes. it? Yes. You've got the Dutch in there with their love of everything naked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> got your Australians in there. There's a, there's a fantastic barbecue in there too. Yeah. The different types of stuff that's coming out from people is quite something. And I think everyone's quite taken aback by how, 
how amazing that all these things are. World War II soldier in there. There's a seaplane with a shark and a guy diving and fishing in yeah. a walnut. This is. Yeah. I think the, the barbecue might be my favourite, though. Oh, it's close, you know. I think, to be honest, a relatively newcomer to the favourite is, is Ian Douthwaite. We've banged on quite a lot about him uh, this episode. Yeah. yeah. Kudos uh, is the only thing I can think of. Um he has done a really fantastic build with the title being our hobby in a nutshell. But yes, check that out. I'm not going to tell you anything more about it. I, I want you to go and find it and look at it. I think it's brilliant. Yep. Really well thought of, really clever. I, I'm now looking at the recent pictures that have been added to the file and I can't quite make out whether that's a window frame going into a nutshell, but <laughs> I, I might be wrong. Also a band, uh, a band called The Nuts. Yeah, uh, apparently they're playing a song called Michelle. I also saw someone had made inside a walnut a wall shaped like a nut. <laughs> it's just, I, do you know what? I, I'm, I'm absolutely dumbfounded, completely dumbfounded of just how this has caught everyone's imagination. It's just phenomenal. Um, I mean, even the uh, the shell on BP by the lovely Steve, really clever. And, and I confess, I confess that mine, my shells are halved, but that's it. I've not got any further with them. Shocking. Which I'm ashamed to say, really. Shocking. Well, you know, there's, there's still time. There's, there's still time. Mm. There's still time. But how are you getting on with your nuts? Well, I can show you. I Actually, while you've been chatting away, I've been uh, nonchalantly painting my death nut. I don't know if you've ever see it. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. It's got the construction inside, the Death Star, and then it's also now got the the hole, which is the radar weapon thing for the, from the Death Star. You see that? <laughs> There's an outcrawling of Star Wars fans screaming at their devices right now. What on but earth? But yes, it's a, it's a walnut, but it looks like a Death Star. <laughs> I'm going to have to dry brush it a lot more than I have uh, <laughs> just to bring out the detail, because at the moment it just looks like a nut. <laughs> and and black. I promise you, there's a shit loads of detail inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah, amazing. I, I'm liking the weapon. Looks right, doesn't it? Yeah. The other thing I've been working on, uh, which I actually did some work today while I was at a modeling session. I have this guy. Wow. So this is my Tie Fighter, which is the instead of the body being a circle, it is actually a nut. So it's got two Tie Fighter wings stuck on the sides. It's been hollowed out, flattened on the front and the back and the top to give it the doors. And it's actually got a dude inside. And you can tell it's got a dude inside because there's an LED inside the nut and you can see the dude inside. Brilliant. So I'm showing James right now. That is brilliant. The only thing I need to do on it is finish the base. The base is still basic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I need to hide the wire, which is just kind of just taped to the back at the moment. And then I don't know what I'm going to do with the battery pack, but probably hide it underneath. But yeah, so there you go. A flying TIE Fighter Walnut from Star Walnuts. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> it's a nice little nightlight, you know? Yeah, I like it. It's really, really good. <laughs> For he that doesn't do electricery, Love it. I was giving somebody advice today about how to put an LED into their build, would you believe? Wow. How, how the mighty have become mightier. <laughs> oh, just how it how it all changes. Yeah, because he says, oh, could you tell me how you do this? Because I don't know anything about electronics. I was like, oh, it's easy. Come under my wing. Let me tell you all about the electronic world. Brilliant. So I just went to the Wish site and said, yeah, buy that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the link. We're going to have a look at the uh, the Warner Challenge group build on Facebook. What are we going to do with all these photographs and these pictures and these entries? Do you think we should do like a Telford table space and just put a load of Warnuts on there, all these people's builds, or what do you think we should do? If you're part of a club and you're displaying at Telford, I think you should persuade the, the club to have a little area for your nuts to be on the table. Maybe you want to take that idea to your club and suggest that you want to challenge your fellow club members. That will increase the uptake on the nuts, because sales are dropping off now. <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about the cost of walnuts has gone up. <laughs> then maybe we will 
try and work in something in which we make a presentation to the best nuts on the table. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What about you? What, what's going on with your nuts then? Why are you not getting on with it? Is it because the the, the hell diver taken over? Yeah, the hell diver has taken over the bench right now. I want to. Oh, okay. It's it's strewn all over the desk, and um, I want to get to a point actually, which probably may be this weekend, where I can mm-hmm. tidy up the, the desk sufficiently enough to make a whole load of mess, and then I can clean up easily. <laughs> you know they don't make that much mess the once you crack them open and you've cleaned it up then that's it because some of my ideas require um some tools that will make a lot of mess i've bought myself i'll show you this i've bought myself some instruments you may be able to see that just oh that's a lot of sharp edges on there the reason being is that there are some ideas that I have that require the nut to be cut quite precisely. So I have a... Always always be really careful when cutting your nuts. I have a Dremel. And what I've just shown Malcolm is some, some new fittings for the Dremel. So it's going to be, sound a little bit like a dentist in here for a day while I, I prepare my nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's going to make a lot of mess and i want to make sure that the hell diver is secure and put away when i do that so yeah you don't want like a pile of walnut dust and try and find your hell diver underneath it <laughs> thinking the scratch building the walnut dust might work quite well as sand oh, wow. in my um hell divers engine intake you never know that would be something else. That would be true scratch building, wouldn't it? The recycled bits from another build. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That's why I've got a 10 foot by 10 foot shed that is uh, I can't get in because everything's in there. Um, and it's all stuff that I've saved from maybe another rainy day. Mm. I've got a date for my shed as well. New shed coming. I'll be uh, building that from then. Pray for good weather, please. <laughs> yeah. And I got to get the electrics in there for uh, somehow as well. So it's going to all go over here. You got a man with a drill for that, though, haven't you? Yeah, a man with a drill and a certificate who's going to do it for. Me. Yeah. He also, I think, wants the blood of my firstborn child as well to be able to do it. Oh, yeah. So yeah, maybe in a month or so's time, I will be in there and producing this podcast from inside there. That's going to be awesome. I know. Interestingly, I know we're not talking about the subject, but it's something I want to talk about kind of quickly. Yeah. Um, I have a fear of spiders. I'm an arachnophobic. Mm-hmm. The idea of going and sitting in a shed is hard. Any shed. You know, if I'm going to go and get the lawnmower or something, it's, mm-hmm. I'm always like, right, I'm going to be seeing spiders now because the spiders live in sheds. Um, that kind of ruins my day. Now, I'm going to be in a shed a lot because that's my hobby shed. So I'm going to be in a shed a lot and I'm going to be encountering spiders. I'm actively currently trying to remove my fear of spiders and anything arachnophobia. Mm -hmm. Arachnophobic. Arachnids. That's the one. Uh, I bought myself a book on spiders. I've joined a Facebook group on UK spiders. So it means that if I'm just randomly looking at Facebook, Every now and again, I see spiders, and every spider I see from now on, I'm going to try and identify it. The idea is that I get immersed in spiders and they don't become such a big deal for my brain. Uh I'm kind of following a a, a plan to get myself um, not scared of spiders anymore, which I I wonder if that's an issue for anyone else who's got a shed and and has a hobby space. If you're arachnophobic, it's probably something that's quite difficult. So, yeah, that was something I just wanted to bring up. See if anyone had the, a similar idea. or you know, I don't want to kill them all. I don't want to get rid of them all. Th- that is not a solution because that's not... It would be if you had a pet that liked eating spiders. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I you know, I can get a chameleon or something, or hang a yeah. gecko from the ceiling or something. <laughs> but that's not a solution for, uh, you know, that's not a long-term solution, is it? No. So. No, especially if you hang the chameleon from the, the roof. That might be a short, sort of short solution. <laughs> well, it worked very quickly, uh, very short amount of time. <laughs> like a, a train the killer chameleon, uh, or like a yeah, a load of amphibians kind of dotted around. Anyway, yeah, yeah, that's my thing. That's what I'm trying to do. Now. 
Yeah, any advice from anybody? Yeah, very good. Yeah, drop us a line. That's an interesting, interesting topic. Yeah, no, I can imagine like, uh, oh, let's let's talk about spiders. Well, I mean, Spider City. Hmm. It won't be Spider City. You're going to line it anyway, aren't you? I'm going to line it. Yeah, I am. But even so, you know. Yeah, so you 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 won't get any more in there than you would get in because it's going to be a fairly it's going to be a sealed shed, isn't it? So you're going to get no more in there than you do in the house. No, maybe not. But uh, yeah, just the the thought the, of it. The reason you find them in sheds generally is because the shed doors don't shut properly and they're easy easy to get in and out of. Yeah, uh, they're like DIY as well, don't they? Yeah. Well, also hmm. bear in mind you're going to have flat surfaces, aren't you? Yes. You're not going to have um, beams and all that sort of stuff. Uh, might have a beam or two. Maybe. Why? Oh, okay. They're not. They like. Do they like beams? Well, I'm just saying if if you've got lots of um, if you're thinking of the interior of a shed where you've got lots of beams, mm. they like that because they can make lots of, of um, what they call them things, webs. Got if you've got a flat surface, they don't really like making webs on flat surfaces because the fly's got to be pretty stupid to fly <laughs> straight into the wall. <laughs> and you? then, I mean, how unlucky could you be as a fly? You fly straight into a wall only to find there's a spider's web on it. Yeah, I'll break your fall, would that? I guess. If you're going to reduce that amount of uh, space for them to to make a home, mm. you should be fine. In our world of making models just like normal life, maybe we have become too lazy. It's just too easy to buy those extras off the shelf, relying on the manufacturers to do all the groundwork for us. Using the skills we've already learned from building those poor fitting kits are just not being stretched to the fullest. Maybe we already do a lot of scratch building for our bases and dioramas, but have you never gone that extra mile with a kit or subject? Making the bases can become just as labour intensive as the kit. Or maybe we just fear the research and effort thinking outside the box using everyday items. <laughs> You've been listening to Just Making Conversation with James Skiffins and Malcolm Childs. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook where if you want. Follow us on Facebook where we post photos, <laughs> updates, and mostly nonsense. <laughs> uh, hmm. Find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and all the others. Let us know what you are just making and what your thoughts are on the conversation in this episode. Thank you to the following supporters from buymeacoffee.com forward slash JMC podcast. Tim, Black Rifle, John, Julian, Chuck, Mark, Bakawahi, Simon, The Jersey Gent, Steve Lee, Costas, Mark, Ray, Neil, Mike, Robert, Andrew, John, John... Andrew, Drew, John, Mike, Jeff, Richard, Lynn, Gordon and six others. If you do show your support, leave your name and we can give you a shout out too. Next time we'll be just making conversation. Oh, that's good. Just drop the mic. Boom, Boom bitches. bitches. I'm out of here. Bye-bye. Right. Goodbye.